Hello, uh, Tulim. It's 3 p.m. already. I think we can start now. Okay. Um, thank you very much to the College of Physicians Malaysia. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Liling, an endocrinologist from the University of Malaya Medical Center. And it's the greatest pleasure that I'll be chairing the medical webinar endocrine chapter that will be the first series um, in, in, in August 2023. And it's also my great honor to, to introduce the speaker today, Dr. Haswani Aziz. Dr. Haswani is a consultant endocrinologist and general physician currently working at Hospital Kajang. Previously, um, she attained an MBBS from um, IUM, followed by um, Master in Medicine uh, from UKM, and she has um, endocrinology fellowship training uh, across different um, Ministry of Health and Ministry of, of Education uh, hospitals. And Dr. Hasmani will be talking to us about how to approach patients with hypercalcemia and hyperparathyroidism. Over to you, Dr. Hasmani. Thank you, Prof Lim, uh, my former lecturer and forever lecturer. <laughs> uh, I'm honoured uh, to be invited by the College of Physicians Malaysia uh, to give a talk on uh, this particular topic. Um, so I'll share first. Okay, can everybody see my slides? Yes, we can see that. Uh, okay, so I'll be talking on the approach uh, uh, of hypercalcemic patients, and I'll be focusing more on the uh, particularly primary hyperparathyroidism uh, to give introductions uh, about uh, the disease. So this is basically the outlines of my talk. I will start with the definition. What are the things that we should know? And then we will move on the most important basic uh, in this topic, which is calcium homeostasis. And we will go through on the hypercalcemic clini uh, hypercalcemia clinical features and then the uh, variety causes of hypercalcemia, which we usually divide into PTH-mediated and non-PTH-related uh, hypercalcemia. And then we will go into the approach to diagnose and management of hypercalcemia and subsequently treatment of hypercalcemia, and we will go through the case scenarios. So first, regarding the uh, definition of hypercalcemia, the one that we are measuring uh, in our lab is actually a serum concentration of total calcium, which the normal range uh, are between 2.15 to 2.60. So basically, if the your serum concentration of calcium is more than 2.6, we label them as hypercalcemia. So the calcium um, very uh, calcium resides in uh, many forms uh, in our serum. 45% of them are bound to plasma proteins, uh, particularly albumin. 10% of them are bound to anions, uh, which is either uh, with a phosphate or citrate. Uh, and another 45% uh, existed as free or ionized calcium in the serum. So um, basically, the free or ionized calcium are usually constant, but it was difficult for us to measure as most of our lab didn't offer this uh, measurement. So if we have a patient with a fluctuating, particularly low serum albumin, we have to uh, correct and find the real total serum calcium, which by my, uh, we minus 40 from our existing serum albumin concentration in patient with severely or significantly hypoalbuminemic, uh, hypoalbuminemic and then we times with 0 0.02, and then we add on with the lab results of total calcium concentration. So that the one that we are treating are the total serum calcium. Okay, these are the spectrum of hypercalcemia. I believe all of you uh, know about this. Mild hypercalcemia is defined by total serum calcium of between 2.6 to 3, moderate 3 to 3.5, and hypercalcemic crisis or severe hypercalcemia is more than 3.5, which require urgent uh, intervention. So before we proceed, I will um, uh, discuss or revise again with all of you regarding the calcium homeostasis. 
These are three or uh, four major organs that involve in the calcium homeostasis being the most important, I would say, is our parathyroid gland. So our parathyroid gland um, produce uh, parathyroid hormones, uh, which exerts its actions on the kidney and bone. What happened to the bone? They increase the uh, bone resorption, subsequently resulted in increased serum calcium and uh, phosphate also. And then uh, parathyroid hormone uh, will activate uh, inactivated vitamin D, which is usually in the form of 25-hydroxy vitamin D, to activated vitamin D in the form of 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. Uh, subsequently, it also will increase the calcium reabsorption and then increase the phosphate excretion. That's why in patients with excessive parathyroid hormone, you will see high calcium and low phosphate because uh, this mechanism happens uh, in the kidney. And then uh, what happened with the activated vitamin D? Activated vitamin D uh, subsequently will increase the calcium and phosphate absorption from the gut. So these are the typical signs and symptoms associated with hypercalcemia. In severe hypercalcemia, patients might come with confusion, uh, even syncope. They will come with extreme fatigue. So basically, you use the uh, mnemonics of stones, bones, abdominal moans, and uh, psychic groans. So basically, stones uh, um, reflected the renal manifestation of the hypercalcemia, usually in the form of nephrolytiasis. Uh, they also might have uh, might come with polyuria and polydipsia secondary to nef nephrogenic DI uh, and also dehydration. In bone skeletal manifestation, they might come with bone paint or in the form of osteitis uh, fibrosa cystica or in premature osteoporosis. So abdominal moans, they will come with the abdominal symptoms. And then uh, in severe hypercalcemia, they might come with neuromuscular uh, manifestation in the form of impact memory, confusion, low GCS, tuberous, and whatnot. And then uh, some of them might come with irritability and depression prior to severe neuromuscular manifestation. So in the ECG, also vital for us to see, particularly shortened QT interval, uh, bundle branch block, uh, bizarre QRS complex, pericardia, even. So these are the example uh, of the features of osteitis fibrosa cystica. They can come with subperiosteal bone resorption, as you can see here. They can come with thinning of distal clavicle or even thinning in the cortex of the bone. Uh, bone cyst formation, as you can see here. Uh, in the skull, you can see some salt and pepper pattern of the skull or pepper pot appearance. So some of them will have like a brown tumor uh, in our long, long bones and generalized osteopenia. So this is um, the ECG changes uh, that you might see in patients with hypercalcemia. Uh, these are one of the common uh, known uh, ECG changes, which is shortened. Um, shorten um, uh, QTC. Sorry, I'm trying to find the laser. Yeah. So these are the um, our T, which is just near our QRS complex. So in this, uh, other than the shortened QTC, we will have also bizarre looking QRS complex, almost like by the branch block, and then uh, you will see some J wave. This J wave is the notching of the terminal QRS complex, uh, which is seen best at the V1 here. Okay, these are the causes of hypercalcemia. Uh, we can we usually divide into parathyroid hormone related and non-parathyroid hormone related, which are malignancy related hypercalcemia, vitamin D related, endocrine disorders, uh, drug related, and other uh, causes. However, from the total hospital admission of hypercalcemia and total presentation of hypercalcemia, 90% of the cases came from primary hyperparathyroidism combined with malignancy-related hypercalcemia. So these are the causes of parathyroid hormone-mediated hypercalcemia. Uh, the most common one would be uh, primary hyperparathyroidism is either in the form of sporadic or familial where it is associated with other syndrome, for example, men. Uh, and then you will also have parathyroid carcinoma in less than 1% of the primary hypoparathyroid uh, population. And then uh, there is also 
uh, entity called familial hypocalciuric hypocalcemia and also in advanced uh, chronic kidney disease patient that might come with tertiary hyperparathyroidism. And then uh, very rare, case, rare, rare cases, you might find ectopic parathyroid hormone in uh, certain malignancies. So first, uh, I will give a view on the primary hyperparathyroidism. So most of them, 85% of them came from single adenoma, uh, multiple adenoma in 5% uh, of them, hyperplastic primary hyperparathyroidism in 10%, and less than 1% of them are malignant proven from the biopsy. Uh, and then the incidence or, and, or the prevalence of the primary hyperparathyroidism, this is one of the uh, more common causes of endocrine disease, which is the pre prevalence in the US is around one in 1,000 of population. Uh, the prevalence will be increased with age and uh, among the postmenopausal women. So these are the hereditary states of hyperparathyroidism. We have MEN1 and MEN2B. Uh, we also have hyperparathyroidism jaw tumor syndrome associated with parathyroid malignancy and other FSH which is also a part of the hereditary uh, hyperparathyroidism. So when we look at the uh, changing trends in presentation of hypercalcemia throughout the, dec the decades uh, until now, we noted that the initial uh, presentation, they usually come with already complications of hypercalcemia, which is nephrolithiasis among the primary hyperparathyroidism. But as we are more advanced, uh, we do screening of calcium in most of our patients. So most of them presented as asymptomatic for hypercalcemia. So these are the diagnostic testing. Uh, that is actually proposed by NICE, which is published uh, 2020, uh, 2019. Uh, we started, they started from the uh, primary care. What, do, what did they uh, suggest? Uh, in patients with uh, serum calcium of corrected calcium of 2.6 or above on at least two separate occasions, or uh, serum cal corrected calcium of 2.5 millimoles or above, on at least two separate occasions and primary hyperparathyroidism is uh, suspected, uh, they suggested to proceed with the PTH measurement. And then the PTH measurement must be measured together with the albumin adjusted serum calcium level to be interpreted correctly. So if uh, these uh, results come up, uh, it is indicated to refer to the endocrinologist when the IPTH is above the midpoint of the referent range and primary hyperparathyroidism is suspected, or IPTH is below the midpoint of reference range with a concurrent albumin-adjusted serum calcium level of 2.6 or below. This is with the logic of if you have excessive calcium, we expect the IPTH to be suppressed, uh, not, not even within the normal range. So these are other investigations uh, that should be done by the uh, tertiary center. Uh, uh, they advocated to measure vitamin D. Uh, it is very important in patients with primary hyperparathyroidism, and you must exclude familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia uh, from the primary hyperparathyroidism itself because of the cost of management would be different. So how do we exclude them? We took 24 hours urine calcium excretion and we measure the random renal calcium uh, creatinine excretion or clearance ratio. So these are the measurement that I usually use. We use a uh, Hammersmith uh, calculator. So as it was stated there, uh, the name is familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia, meaning your calcium uh, in the urine uh, should be low. Huh? So we, we, will, we will exclude the FSH if the calcium creatinine ratio is more than 0 0.01 from the calculation. So what is a familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia? Uh, in this genetic uh, condition, uh, they will have inactivated uh, mutation of, uh, of the calcium sensor. So from the parathyroid hormone, we need higher serum calcium to shut off the parathyroid secretion. So what is the effect of the uh, inactivation of the calcium sensor in the renal tubular cell cells? They need uh, uh, higher serum concentration of serum calcium 
in order to stop the urinary calcium reabsorption. Hence, they will have increased urinary calcium reabsorption. So this is an autosomal dominant inheritance. And then, however, uh, don't be fooled, some of them, 35% of them would uh, with, with genetically verified FSH will have will still have calcium creatinine ratio of more than or equals to 0 0.01. The most important thing why we have to exclude from primary hypoparathyroidism is the treatment for familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia is not by removing the parathyroid or thyroidectomy. It is through the uh, uh, through the um, through the increase the fluid intake and also monitoring of the calcium. Usually because this is a very benign disease, uh, so usually what we do, we just advise them to take proper or uh, high, a bit high fluid intake uh, per day. And usually they won't come with the complication as per primary hypoparathyroidism. So after we reassess and we rule out uh, familial uh, FSH, uh, the further investigation in the uh, primary hypoparathyroidism is to assess the complications. So we have to do the DEXA scan or BMD scan uh, to look uh, for the bone resorption, increased bone resorption. Uh, usually the bone resorption, we advocate to do the distal radius first because uh, primary hypopara might affect your cortical bone first before your trabecular bone, which resides in your lumbar and your hip. So, and after that, uh, we look at the uh, kidney complications, measure the EGFR, they might have chronic kidney disease or ultrasound scans to look for the uh, nephrolithiasis or nephrocalcinosis. So then, uh, if the patient is indicated for surgery, the patient might need preoperative imaging for the, uh, uh, for the identification of the uh, parathyroid loop uh, that was indicated for surgery. So next, I will move to the causes of non-parathyroid related hypercalcemia, which will be divided into malignancy related hypercalcemia, vitamin D, endocrine disorder, drugs, and others. So basically, in malignancy related hypercalcemia, we have uh, main two uh, pathophysiology uh, plus one with uh, vitamin D related. So the first one is humoral uh, hypercalcemia of malignancy, what does it mean? Because of the paraneoplastic syndrome uh, that was secret, uh, result from the secretion of the parathyroid hormone-related protein, PTHRP, by the primary tumor. So basically, we can measure the PTHRP uh, RP in the patient that we suspect, humoral uh, hypercalcemia of malignancy. So mostly, it involves squamous carcinoma, uh, which is PTHRP, RP, uh, and then uh, the uh, organs that usually involve are solid tumors, for example, lungs, esophageal tumor, skin tumor, cervix, uh, breast, and kidney tumor, kidney carcinoma. So the next uh, important uh, pathophysiology is from the local osteolysis. So this is mostly observed in the hematological cancer, particularly multiple myeloma and breast cancer. So next, uh, in uh, some malignancy related, particularly lymphoproliferative disease, example lymphoma uh, and granulomatous disease, uh, the hypercalcemia might be resulted from the vitamin D uh, causes. So why? Because uh, these uh, malignant cells and granulomas, uh, they are macrophages, uh, will be overexpressing 1-alpha-hydroxylase. What does 1-alpha-hydroxylase do? They increase the conversion of carcidiol, uh, which is inactive form of vitamin D, to carcitriol from 25 OH to 125 uh, dihydroxy uh, vitamin D. So this will increase the intestinal absorption of the calcium from the activated vitamin D and resulted in hypercalcemia. So because of this um, uh, non-regulated uh, production of active form of vitamin D, so the patient will no longer be subjected uh, by the regulation of parathyroid hormone to control the serum calcium in the body. So these are the 
uh, common causes of uh, hypercalcemia related mediated by the uh, increased activated vitamin D. The common one as well in Malaysia are tuberculosis, uh, sarcoidosis, and other systemic fungal infection, for, for example, cryptococcosis and histoplasmosis. These are the other long list of um, vitamin D mediated uh, uh, hypercalcemia, uh, which is um, published data. So what about the endocrine disorder? Uh, so these are the three main endocrine disorder that might lead to the hypercalcemia. First is hyperthyroidism. Second is usually we talk about Edisonian uh, condition. And then the third one is pheochromocytoma. So how does hyperthyroidism lead to hypercalcemia? It is related to the increase in rank ligand mediated bone resorption, uh, which is stimulated by the hyperthyroidism. So uh, in pheochromocytoma, sometimes the patient might uh, present with uh, hypercalcemia because they have concomitant primary hyperparathyroidism in the setting of MEN2. And uh, some uh, pheochromocytomas also documented to have secreted this uh, PTHRP uh, that can uh, lead to the hypercalcemia from the stimulation of bone resorption. So in Edisonian crisis, so sometimes we have to exclude uh, the underlying disorder, tuberculosis example, can lead to the uh, uh, hypocortisolism from the adrenal involvement and also hypercalcemia might be contributed, co-contributed by the tuberculosis granulitis disease itself or because of the basically uh, dehydration state in Edisonian uh, condition where they will be reduced in extracellular fluid volume and associated with the relative hypoalbuminemia in the um, um, a dehydrated state. So these are the common drugs that is related to the hypercalcemia. It's important for you to rule out before uh, coming to the next stage of the management. First, thiazide diuretics, where 8% where of the patients on these thiazide diuretics reported to have hypercalcemia. Lithium, what does lithium do? It increases calcium reabsorption and it is also uh, directly stimulated uh, parathyroid hormone secretion. So it is related. Sometimes uh, we consider it lithium as a parathyroid hormone uh, related hypercalcemia. Also, Mikalis syndrome because high calcium intake, vitamin D uh, give direct uh, effect to the bone that will stimulate uh, osteoclastic resorption and inhibit uh, osteoblastic uh, formation. Parathyroid hormone, uh, for example, patient on teriparatide, on osteoporosis treatment, and vitamin D intoxication. So other causes, uh, immobilization. Why? Immobilization will suppress the bone formation and increase bone resorption. So in individuals with high bone turnover, for example, in patients with Paget's disease or in younger individuals, we see more common of hypercalcemia complication uh, as a complication of the immobilization. So in acute renal failure, the documented uh, hypercalcemia is seen when it is associated with rhabdomyolysis, where there will be dissolution of dystrophic calcification of traumatized muscle. And there are a uh, few papers that documented uh, renal transplant related hypercalcemia. So how do we approach hypercalcemia? As what I've mentioned before, you should take proper history, physical examination, a thorough uh, family history and take the baseline investigation. Uh, urea creatinine because the, uh, the AKI can be a complication of hypercalcemia. Phosphate might indicate to us either uh, this is parathyroid uh, dependent or not. Uh, the albumin level to properly correct your uh, calculate correctly your total calcium serum in the body. And then after that, we can measure the parathyroid hormones. So PTH dependent hypercalcemia, we expect the parathyroid hormone to be within normal range or high, not only high, within normal range also. Because in hypercalcemia, we expect the PTH to be suppressed. So after we, uh, uh, we got the PTH and it was within normal range or high, we can, uh, our next step is to exclude FSH by measuring 24-hour urine calcium and creatinine ratio and calculate. So if it's low, uh, so we can safely say this is FSH. If it's high, we should investigate either this is primary hypopara, tertiary hypopara, or drug-induced, for example, lithium, as what I mentioned before. 
So in uh, if the PTH turn out to be low, uh, then we have all a uh, whole list of differential diagnosis. And then we have to search hard uh, based on the patient uh, background history and then other investigation that might help uh, the most uh, easiest one are the uh, ALP, uh, the serum uh, protein electrophoresis, urine protein electrophoresis, free light chain. Uh, and then uh, we look for any evidence of malignancy, any altered bowel habit or things like that that might suggest. Uh, check for the breast, any breast lama. Uh, and then uh, we proceed uh, with the uh, suspicious nurse that we have uh, during uh, after we examine the patient. So we can measure in PTH RP secreting neoplasm. If we measure their PTH would be low, huh? but you can send for PTH RP. I believe it's not available um, uh, in Malaysia uh, till now, um, especially in KKM, of course, it's not available. So for vitamin D related, you can confirm them by measuring 125 dihydroxy uh, colecalciferol, which is not available in the KKM facilities, uh, because the one that we are measuring are uh, calcidiol or 25 hydroxy uh, vitamin D, but this is 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, so a bit tricky. Uh, so we proceed uh, and uh, trace fast our myeloma workout, and uh, then we can move on with our next line of action. So these are another um, tactic, algorithm in uh, diagnosing um, uh, hypercalcemia. So in this um, in this um, uh, in this paper, uh, they suggest if uh, we have already measured serum parathyroid hormone and it was high. Uh, or within normal result, meaning it is not suppressed. Uh, they advocated to trace uh, the vitamin D level first, the 25-hydroxy vitamin D. If it's low, meaning uh, less than 50, our endocrine society took maybe less than 75, they suggested for us to uh, replace first the vitamin D. After that, measure first. But I think uh, talking from the clinical point of view, it's very difficult for us to get uh, vitamin D level um, very fast. Maybe we can do it if we have the facilities. Uh, but it's okay. Uh, you can uh, proceed with the FSH uh, exclusion first and then at the same time send the 25 hydroxy vitamin D. Next, we move to the treatment for hypercalcemia. So, in mild hypercalcemia, uh, by mild, I mean the corrected serum calcium of less than 2.5. Uh, first, we must stop any precipitating factors, uh, identify any precipitating factors, hyperthyroidism, Edisonian, or any drugs uh, related, uh, for example, thiazide. And then the most common cause for mild hypercalcemia uh, in, 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 in our practice usually are primary hyperparathyroidism. So uh, we have to approach this uh, according to the guideline provided. Uh, because uh, the mainstay of the treatment is the surgery. But not all patients are indicated for surgery. Maybe a, a small portion of the patient are asymptomatic and we can still uh, watch and wait. So these are the indications for surgery in asymptomatic primary hyperparathyroidism. If they are young, age less than 70, if the serum calcium more than 1 milligram or more than 0 0.25 uh, millimoles above upper limit of the calcium normal, uh, the skeletal manifestation, there are evidence of osteoporosis, there are, uh, there are uh, the patient presented with uh, fractures, vertebral fractures, particularly when they have renal manifestation, when EGFR less than 60, when they have renal stone nephrocalcinosis, or when they, are has, when they have significant hypercalciuria, meaning the, uh, the, the calcium in the urine is more than 400 milligram per day. So uh, if they are not um, indicated yet for surgery, we can still watch and wait. There are also options for medical therapy in patients with uh, significant hypercalcemia, in the mal, um, uh, mal group, mal hypercalcemic group. So uh, uh, we have option of sinacalcet, uh, 
uh, which is a form of casimimetic agent. Uh, this is very pricey, but it can be done. Uh, what does it do? It binds to our calcium sensing receptor. So uh, it will exert intracellular effect to reduce the parathyroid hormone synthesis and secretion. So in 70% of the patient will have normalized serum calcium, but some of them will not have that so significant reduction in calcium. So the dose regimen is 30 to 120 milligram per day, can be taken as BD dosing. However, from the study said, there are no effect uh, on BMD or preventive of osteoporosis uh, with uh, using Sinacalcet. So these are the guidelines for monitoring patients with asymptomatic primary hyperparathyroidism. We screen the calcium annually. We do a skeletal uh, uh, survey by using uh, uh, BMD, DEXA scan, uh, every one to two years. And then we do also imaging of the spine to assess uh, vertebral fracture. For example, we look at the height uh, loss or back pain. And then uh, we do renal screening complication, uh, serum creatinine and EGFR um, annually or any suspected renal stone. Uh, screening. So we monitor them every one to, uh, yearly and do DEXA every two yearly. If they progress, they might be indicated for surgery. So what about severe hypercalcemia? This is not an uncommon condition that we face as inpatient. Uh, as you know, if they come with moderate site of hypercalcemia, meaning the calcium ranges from 3 to 3.5, uh, you might, you can take time or can uh, initiate treatment as daycare patient. Huh? But if the patient uh, uh, serum calcium is already more than 3.5, it is indicated or mandatory for them to get admitted to the hospital. But it depends on the tolerability of the patient. If the calcium is 3.2, but we know the patient has already been confused and whatnot, of course, it is an indicator for urgent admission. So uh, emergency treatment, of course, our first line is always fluid, fluid and fluid. Uh, we give aggressive intravenous hydration. Uh, the suggested uh, volume are around three to four liters of normal saline daily. So it range from six pints to eight pints. Sometimes I can go uh, on to 10 pints per day. Or we give one to two liters bolus that of normal saline and followed by the 200 to 250 ml saline hourly. Well, also uh, come back as around four or five liters per day. So the rationale is because they are severely dehydrated and uh, so we have to replace intravascularly uh, with fluid and then it is contributed also by nephrogenic DI uh, and then uh, because of they are not, not well, they, are, they have reduced water intake. So we have to replace this. So what about loop diuretics? Loop diuretics have uh, different opinion from different authors. Uh, the one that uh, they suggest are frusamide. Um, however, uh, from the various meta-analyses and RCTs, huh, uh, they concluded that uh, loop diuretics has limited or no evidence to support the use in patients with severely hypercalcemia. In fact, it might worsen electrolyte derangement and volume depletion. So what does loop diuretic do? It will increase the urine calcium excretion by inhibiting renal calcium reabsorption in the thick ascending loop of Henle and proximal and distal renal tubule. And it also interferes with the chloride co-transport system. So um, yeah, they, they put asterisk eh, uh, beside the loop diuretics because not everybody agrees. Uh, they say uh, even in patients with uh, fluid overloaded uh, post-fluid uh, boluses, we, we have to use loop diuretics uh, very cautiously, meaning not in the very high dose. Huh? So the uh, second agent uh, that is stated here is calcitonin. We love calcitonin because the onset of action is very fast. Uh, the dose will be around 4 to 8 units per kg, intramuscular or subcutaneously. We give every 6 to 12 hours, uh, 12 hourly yeah, for uh, up to 72 hours. So what does calcitonin do? Again, it, also, it inhibit bone resorption by interfering with osteoclastic function and it promotes urinary calcium excretion. 
the problem with the calcitonin is tachyphylaxis, meaning after you use it for after uh, 48 to 72 hours, you might have um, rebound increment in uh, serum calcium because of this tachyphylaxis effect. Huh? So we expect after we give calcitonin, the onset of action is between four to six hours. Uh, however, duration of action is very fast, uh, ranges from six to eight hours. Huh? And it lowers calcium by 0 0.25 to 0 uh, 0 0.5 millimoles only. So before I proceed with the other pharma uh, pharmacological uh, therapy uh, in, hyper in severe hypercalcemia, uh, we'd like to revise a bit about our osteoclastic formation and activity. So in the A, in the uh, top uh, picture, these are the normal activation of osteoclastic activity. So uh, what does your, the, sec, the, the next agent that I will be introducing is the bisphosphonate. You can see in the picture C, what does bisphosphonate do? Bisphosphonate will bind uh, on your osteoclast and it will inactivate your osteoclast. Then your osteoclast will be in apoptotic, meaning they won't promote any more osteoclastic or bone resorption activities. So what does dinosumab do? So the dunosumab will bind with the uh, RAN-KL ligand and then uh, it will uh, inhibit the formation of the osteoclast itself, meaning it inhibit during the pre-osteoclastic formation itself. So uh, the bisphosphonate, so we have uh, practically two options. Uh, there are other options, but not commonly used. Uh, the one that widely available, I think because of the um, because of the cost issue is pamidronate. Uh, uh, we give IV uh, over two up to 24 hours based on the kidney performance of the patient. Uh, the dose would be between 60 to 90 milligram uh, per uh, slow infusion. So the onset of action, not as fast as the calcitonin, we take around two to three days to start uh, reducing your calcium and then the effect might last from two to four weeks. So it normalized calcium in 60 to 70 percent of the patient and however we should be cautious it is contraindicated uh, if your EGFR is less than 30 or some book took it as 35 because it might further damage your kidney. Huh? So another important uh, adverse event uh, while uh, administrating pamidronate is the acute phase response. So basically what happened, patient just feel very feverish, uh, not feeling well, maybe some nauseous during the pamidronate infusion. You must reassure the, the patient if they feel feverish, you can give some uh, apa tu, paracetamol for the patient. Huh? So the other uh, long-term effects of pamidronate, uh, atypical femoral fractures or ONG, uh, osteonecrosis of the jaw, not in the acute setting. So um, the next uh, bisphosphonate option are zolindronic acid. The dose is between three to four milligram uh, intravenous. So we can give a fast between 15 to 30 minutes, not not as uh, long duration infusion as per pamidronate. Uh, it is uh, the same onset of action between two to three days. The duration of action a bit more potent. Uh, to, it can normalize your calcium in 80 to 90% of the patient. And then the duration of action is longer between four to six weeks. Huh? As uh, same as the pamidronate, uh, should be careful. Uh, contraindicated with if your EGFR is less than 30 or some, some people take 35 and then we should have those adjustments uh, if the EGFR between 30 to 60. So the next agent is dinosumab. The dose will be 60 to 120 milligram given subcutaneously. So uh, these are the uh, guidelines uh, from the uh, hypercalcemia in malignancy. Uh, they advocated to repeat uh, the you can monitor the calcium and you might want to repeat the dimosumab after one, two and four weeks later and monthly thereafter, uh, particularly in malignancy related hypercalcemia. So uh, the onset of action, same a bit longer from the bisphosphonate, three to 10 days, 
So um, time to complete the response is around 23 days. Median duration of e effect is around 100 days. So it is less potent compared with the zoledronic acid where it normalized calcium in at least 70% of the patient. We chose dinosumab because um, we can use them in patients with slightly advanced kidney injury. So uh, we can use up to 15. I use my uh, limit of EGFR 15 and above, uh, but be careful if the EGFR uh, between 13 to uh, 15 to 30, you have higher risk of hypocalcemia. So you might want to choose with a lower dose of dinosumab. So head to head comparison, and what I mentioned before, zolindronic acid is more uh, efficacious. Uh, and longer duration of action compared with the pamidronate. So is glucocorticoid has any value in treatment of hypercalcemia? The answer is yes, particularly in patient that is uh, the mechanism of hypercalcemia is due to the vitamin D related because what glucocorticoid do, it will inhibit uh, excessive one alpha hydroxylase enzyme production by the macrophages from our granulitis disease or lymphoma. So hence, it uh, will reduce the uh, calcium level. Uh. So the dose, we have two dosing here uh, with IV hydrocortisone, around 200 to 400 milligram daily for three to five days. You might opt to give 50 milligram QID. We can choose with prednisolone with a dose of 60 milligram per day for 10 days or 10 to 20 milligram per day for seven days and monitor the response. The onset of action, it might take two to five days huh, to give the uh, calcium reduction effect. Okay, hemodialysis is... Uh, is the is an option in patient with a, a refractory hypocalcemia, meaning when they have treatment failure, and it is um, in favor for patient who receive hemodialysis or with severe renal insufficiency. When EGFR is already less than fifteen, you have no other option uh, except for hemodialysis. So of course we have to treat the underlying disease. Okay, we have, I have two cases to portray here. Uh, two interesting cases, quite long, but we will go through together. So this is a young girl, 19 years old girl, admitted to orthopedic ward for pathological fracture, left neck of humerus huh? uh, from sleep in the bathroom, meaning this is fragility fracture. Huh? She had uh, hypercalcemic symptoms, polyuria, polydipsia, significant weight loss for more than one year and lethargy and generalized bony pain, but never seek any medical attention before that. Uh, she was amenorrheic also uh, since the start of the illness. However, no other symptom to suggest um, apa tu, uh, men, lah, men 1 or uh, 2A, no history of pheochromosome. So she appeared cachexic, the weight is only 29 kilo. Uh, and then uh, there is a left neck nodule, uh, size uh, three times three centimeter. Uh, ten, uh, we can palpate lah, the left neck nodule. Uh, the tenor is quite okay between four to five. Others are unremarkable. So these are the uh, skull of the patient. Uh, as you can see, there are small dots Huh? in the skull. This is what we call uh, paper pot appearance huh? uh, of the skull of the patient. So these are the neck of humerus, neck of humerus uh, fracture. So the next, if you can see the pelvic and uh, also neck of femur, there are no fractures here uh, with, after we confirm with the orthopedic uh, surgeon's colleague. Uh, however, as you can see, generalize the pelvic bone and also the, the cortex uh, of the femur is very thin, huh? very thin in fact. So these are the investigation. The corrected calcium is sky high, 4.1 with low phosphate, 0 0.69 also only. The IPTH is very high, almost 20 times upper limit normal. The vitamin D level is only 15 nanomole per liter. We, we aim to 
uh, bring up the vitamin D level up to 50, but this is only 1.5 with very high ALP from the fractures and whatnot. So our 24-hour urine calcium is 0. Uh, urine uh, calcium creatinine ratio is 0 0.05, meaning we already excluded FSH in this patient. The thyroid function is normal. She is not in Edisonian crisis or whatnot. Uh, the creatinine is okay so far. So these are the BMD that we have. I'm sorry, I didn't have the Z score from the HIP, but as you can see, by right, we should be reading the Z score because this is pathological fracture. Right? The spine L1 is only um, uh, negative uh, 5.0. Huh? So meaning severely osteoporotic. Okay, so what, what have the patient received? Uh, she did receive uh, three times of IV pamidronate with around one week or less than one week apart with hydration of five liter per day. She did have to receive uh, calcitonin for three subsequent days and then we have to stop it. And then it's very difficult to keep the calcium less than three. And then because of the severely vitamin D deficiency, we started her on colicalciferol 1000 IU daily. So, and then patient was referred to endocrine surgeon for parathyroidectomy after the parathyroid imaging. Actually, uh, she had giant uh, parathyroid adenoma. Lah, so, that's why we can palpate from the neck mass. So, post-surgery, uh, she developed, as expected, uh, quite bad hungry bone syndrome. But after that, she was discharged well. So, this is my interesting uh, second case. I have a 73 years old Chinese gentleman with no known medical illness, she's a very healthy um, gentleman, huh? uh, presented to us with, uh, sounds like a stroke, uh, giddy and right-sided hemiparesis for one month duration. Uh, she had some uh, giddiness and postural related. Uh, most likely, this is hypovolemic symptoms. Uh, she also, he also constipated. Uh, and uh, other than that, uh, not significant. She, he denied any contact with TB patient, denied uh, doing any uh, traveling or jungle trekking. So uh, drug history, he didn't take anything. He denied taking any vitamin D or calcium supplement. So from physical examination upon presentation, uh, she's very dehydrated and cachexic. Of course, the uh, um, um, the power uh, is very actually non-specific. Eh? It's more of the weakness. Eh? Bilateral limb power is around three to four. So these are the results when he presented. The corrected calcium is three point zero five. The phosphate zero point nine one, meaning the phosphate is not low. So this gives us idea. Most likely, this is not parathyroid related. Uh, hypercalcemia. He also presented with some AKI, which resolved later. So the HB was okay. Uh, the ECG was nothing. The CT brain reported as multifocal lacuna infarct with small vessel disease and cerebral atrophy. We are unable to proceed with the MRI. Uh, echo showed nothing because we are looking hard. Huh? Uh, regarding the hypercalcemia, uh, he settled uh, with the normal cell line uh, infusion only. He didn't require any secondary pharmacological uh, drug to reduce the calcium. So because of the history of constipation, we might be a part of the hypercalcemia symptoms. We do think uh, with the cachexic um, appearance, we do think he might uh, be having colorectal carcinoma causing this hypercalcemia. So, as we expected, uh, with the calcium of 2.9 during this time, the IPTH is 0 0.77, meaning it's suppressed. This is non-IPTH dependent. So, vitamin D level, this is not within, the, not within the toxic level. This is still within the normal level. We are unable to get 125 hydroxy vitamin D because it has to be sent to the private. And then the cortisol was normal. It's not hyperthyroid. Uh, and then the urine calcium creatinine ratio is not low. Uh, from the ultrasound KUB and uh, CTU, I'll show you the. Okay, I'll 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 show you the X-ray abdomen afterwards. So, uh, we did look hard to look at colorectal cancer or any uh, occult malignancy. The tumor markers are all normal. Uh, OGDS, uh, 
showed on the benign fundal gland polyp uh, from the biopsy. So nothing there. Colonoscopy also was normal till terminal ileum. The so blood picture doesn't show any rouleau formation. And then serum uh, protein electrophoresis and urine electrophoresis also was negative for monoclonal gamma batteries. So these are the chest x-ray. So we didn't see anything to suggest tuberculosis or any granulitis disease. Uh, but as you can see here, he got uh, left uh, staghorn calculi. So we proceed with the CTTAP. It was reported as uh, he showed some uh, three in buds appearance uh, in the upper lobe here. It's very, uh, very subtle. So it was reported as bilateral tiny nodules with right upper lobe three in buds appearance. Uh, uh, so they were suggesting maybe we need to rule out tuberculosis. Uh, however, sputum, uh, AFB, all are negative. Then we go and have a look at the patient again. Uh, we did send sputum culture, uh, sputum AFB, gastric AFB, lavage also was negative for TB. Uh, we re-examined back and then lucky, and, and we found out there is right cervical limb nodes palpable, which we can't find. We didn't get to it during the first examination. Size is good size, around two times two times two centimeter diameter, because we it really suggestive. Uh, it the CT uh, TAP really suggestive for TB. We advise patient for bronchoscopy, but he strongly refused. Okay, then because of the CT TAP, there are some uh, report as lobulated hypodense adrenal lesion. And then we have hypercalcemia with unknown cause. We did proceed with the uh, adrenal um, CT. So as what you can see, uh, both adrenal gland is enlarged, uh, multi-septated and ring enhancement. Uh. So this is quite typical for granulomatous disease or uh, fungal <laughs> infection, uh, particularly tuberculosis or uh, up to any fungal infiltrations, uh, the multi-septated hypodense rim enhancement at the bilateral adrenal. So as what I've told you before, he only required uh, fluid resuscitation and maintenance. Uh, we are able to bring the um, uh, calcium from highest 3.16 to 2.74. So the adrenal function tests basically are normal. So we did send for cervical lip nodes biopsy. Uh, surprise, surprise, it turned out as the consistent with fungal infection, uh, possibly either histoplasmosis, cryptococcosis, or penicillosis. Uh, this is very interesting. So this is the grocot metanamine silver stain. As you can see, there is yeast present, present here at the yellow area here with the budding yeast. Huh? It's a budding yeast. Quite suggestive. So we did send serum cryptococcal antigen, which is positive, although the title is quite low, one in 10. So our diagnosis is disseminated cryptococcosis with lung involvement, lymph nodes involvement, and adrenal gland involvement. So then what did we do? We consulted ID uh, consultants, and the patient was started on IV M4B, subsequently uh, given a uh, tablet flu cytosine. As you can see, after he was discharged, he maintained, uh, after uh, almost completing the treatment, he maintained the serum calcium to be only 2.38 uh, after proper treatment. Okay. So that's all. Thank you from me. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Hasmani. Um, excellent presentations with a uh, very nice overview of the acute and long-term management of hypercalcemia. So we actually have a lot of questions. I think some, some, some questions that um, you would have presented just now but we're trying mm. to compile them. So mm. let's start number one, uh, mm. pertaining to your case one. So actually presented with uh, severe hypercalcemia, right? Mm. So we have questions from, from the audience saying that, number one, how do you decide what will be the type of hyperhydration <coughs> regimen, the saline diuresis regimen? Mm. So, Second uh, is, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, about the, the uh, saline uh, diuresis uh, regimen uh, first. Yeah. Uh, at first, uh, it based on our uh, clinical assessment, uh, how severe is uh, the patient? Does the patient come with hypovolemic shock? 
So of course, if they come with hypovolemic shock, we have to instill uh, around one to two liters uh, bolus tap as what as how we are managing the dengue lah, up to 30 mils per kg body weight. And after that, the maintenance. The maintenance can range from three liters to four liters. Usually, uh, if the patient had no or low risk for uh, having complication as per heart failure or renal failure or fluid overloaded, I will start with uh, most likely um, so far around six pints to eight pints and see the response and the urine output. And then if patient come with nephrogenic DI, they will have pouring of urine. So I will, uh, I will, we will try to chase the urine pouring also, try to maintain the positive balance. Mm. Yeah, maybe just a brief overview of why we are mm. using normal saline instead mm. of D5%. Oh, okay. Uh, because <laughs> we try to uh, instill the uh, normal osmola fluid la, as uh, how we are resuscitating patient with hypovolemia. I, I don't see any reason why we need to use the uh, upper to D5 or hypo osmola Thank uh, you. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, because <laughs> they, they also have a similar co-transporter, the sodium and calcium at the loop of Handley. And hence, mm -hmm. when you actually give a saline diuresis, so this is a keyword, eh? mm -hmm. when, mm -hmm. when the, the animals, um, yeah, when you're going for, for exams, you have to tell us this is saline diuresis because this um, is a sodium and calcium co-transporter at the loop of Handley and hence this actually promote uh, calcium excretion. So mm. still back to the, the, the saline diuresis, the, um, they were asking that how frequent would you monitor calcium for your case one when, when it first presented with severe hypercalcemia? Mm. Once you have started uh, uh, on the saline diuresis. Uh, yeah. Uh, usually uh, after I start with saline diuresis because the calcium is four, that's very high, uh, I will... Uh, give the diuresis and maybe I will repeat the serum calcium after eight hours or six hours after that. And then uh, in this uh, case one, uh, I, I would have opted to start the Sinacal set at the first presentation itself because I want to bring down the uh, calcium fast on top of the bisphosphonate. Bisphosphonate will work uh, up to after two to three days, but uh, with Sinacal set, we can see as early as after uh, six hours of uh, like calcitonin. Yeah, the, sorry, the sinacacid. Uh, the calcitonin. Sorry, probably. Calcitonin. The calcitonin. Yes, yes. So one question was also on calcitonin, Dr. Haswani. Uh, how will you mm -hmm. decide how to start and how to titrate? Okay, so I will choose uh, calcitonin in patient with life-threatening hypercalcemia or severely hypercalcemia with symptomatic hypercalcemia. They might be stuporous. Uh, DCS is slow. Uh, and then the calcium, um, uh, uh, meaning um, uh, they are also neurological manifestation. I want to bring down fast. Uh, so uh, the question is sinacal set, is it? Sorry. Uh, uh, calcitonin uh, still I, have I, a role. The, the calcitonin, uh, yeah, the, the calcitonin yeah. yes. And then uh, because I want to bring down the calcium very fast, uh, which I think uh, if I'm using the um, normal cell line or cell line diuresis itself, uh, might not be uh, might not be as fast uh, uh, to bring down the calcium. I will start in this group of patient first on top of the other second agent, for example, bisphosphonate. This is uh, how I chose the patient for um, calcitonin. And the first case has a vitamin D deficiency, right? That was only mm -hmm. 15 nanomoles per liter. Yeah. So they are interested in knowing how to decide <laughs> on the replacement okay. therapy. Yeah. Yes, yes. Vitamin D deficiency um, uh, is very tricky uh, in managing in patients with concomitant uh, primary hyperparathyroidism or other cause of hypercalcemia. Um, but we have to replace it because if we didn't replace, your parathyroid hormone will keep climbing up. Uh, so from the literature that I've used, they have uh, they uh, advocated to use it uh, cautiously, meaning we use with a low dose first, like 800 to 1000 IU per day. This is the dose is uh, stated uh, by the uh, previous uh, literature done uh, because in normal people with 
no hypercalcemia and whatnot, we might want to replace like 50,000 IU per week and whatnot. For, but in this uh, particular patient, they advocate to start with around 1,000 IU per day first and see the response rather than uh, jump with a high dose huh, because of the worry of the hypercalcemia itself. Okay. Um, then next question is, it, it, it would be um, case one where we worry about hungry bone syndrome. Mm, so okay. how yeah what was the management the preparation <laughs> okay and post hungry up, bone yeah. i didn't touch hungry bone because i have uh, so many things to talk so i choose the basic ones first so first uh hungry bone syndrome we uh must try to avoid before it happened huh? number one if patient had uh, vitamin d deficiency we have to replace it because post parathyroidectomy uh it might worsen your Uh, hungry bone syndrome. So number two, there are indicators uh, that uh, might tell you the patient might have high risk for um, um, hungry bone syndrome. The indicators are serum ALP, the higher they are, the higher risk. Low magnesium also an, an indicator for hungry bone syndrome. If patient had already bone manifestation from primary hyperparathyroidism, Uh, such as uh, fractures or osteoporosis or uh, brown tumor and whatnot. So uh, replace your vitamin D, uh, and then um, and then we have to anticipate lah this hungry bone syndrome hmm, post operatively. And and hence you may see that some 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 people some of us may use um, hmm. IV bisphosphonate. Yeah, some bisphosphonate actually also. Start, yeah, yeah. Uh, correct. Is that an option also? Uh, yeah. And Before activated the, the uh, all these are actually in preparation for operation yeah. and for prevention uh, to minimize the risk of hungry bone syndrome. Um, yeah, we're actually beyond the timer. So do we need to address all or you, you want to continue so you quickly answer all or how? Uh, College of Physician. Oh, okay. Uh, Dr. Lim. Oh, yeah, somebody asked. Yeah. yeah, still have a few quite interesting questions though. Ah, or maybe yeah, we yeah. give quick answers if, if they are all right. Um, mm. So if patients um, opt for primary hyperparathyroidism, but they opt for um, uh, medical therapy, so we have decided to give Sina Calcet. Mm. How will you titrate? And, and what's your target? Yeah, um, Sina Calcet is very, it's not cheap. It can uh, cost thousands per month. So far in KKM facilities, uh, we can try to apply with the KPK, uh, but quite difficult. Uh, so uh, we start, uh, I usually start with the low dose, basically because of the cost purpose. <laughs> and then I try to uh, titrate up. And then uh, my target calcium, I think less than three, I'll be more than happy enough. Okay. Probably any more, huh? any idea, any other idea? <laughs> Yeah, you, you, usually we start with about 25 a day and then we, when yeah. we monitor every yeah. two weeks, you will say then we burn chi endo because endo always asks you to, to, yeah. to repeat the tests every two has, weeks. Nephrologists <laughs> have more money to buy Sinakal set. Then. <laughs> yeah, and, and we usually, it, it may just go up to about uh, 150 twice a day mm. or uh, I mean total of 300 milligram daily. Okay, mm. so other questions, it would be Um, okay, this one is pretty practical. They may see end-stage kidney disease or mm. heart failure people come in with mm. severe hypercalcemia. Mm. So uh, would the hydration regimen different? Um, I would say how advanced is the end-stage disease? If they already came with an uric kidney, the only answer is hemodialysis. Mm. If mm. the patient still having some sort of urine, you might try. Maybe you try with a small amount of fluid. Maybe we'll try with one liter over four hours and see how either they can tolerate or not. But your, if your calcium cannot wait, the only option is hemodialysis. And refer ICU. Yeah, mm -hmm. refer ICU. Maybe the patient need CVVH if their heart cannot take the regular dialysis. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, one is actually on tyrosine-induced hypercalcemia. You say we may discontinue thiazide. Then, and hence, how soon should we repeat the IPDH level? 
Oh, I I don't presume we should repeat the IPTH level. We see the response from the calcium level, meaning if the calcium come down without uh with stopping the uh thiazide, meaning we are at the right track lah. If your serum calcium still at the high level and is still climbing up, maybe we have other secondary cause of hypoglycemia. I I don't see that we need to repeat the IPTH. Just monitor okay. the calcium, huh? How about lithium induced hyperparathyroidism? Do mm. we stop? If yeah, we were to st ah, stop, yeah. <laughs> we discuss with psychiatrists. Discuss with the psychiatrist, yeah. <laughs> have to discuss with the psychiatrist any other option. But once you stop, your calcium will normalize. Then what if not normalized? When would you suspect that you need to investigate for, for primary hyperparathyroidism after stopping lithium? Mm. Um, if we are able to stop the lithium, and then your, um, uh, I I can't really remember how many, how what is the duration, uh, that it take for the lithium once we stop, and how many days or how many weeks it will take for the calcium to come down. But I think it's no harm seeing the serum calcium like weekly or whatnot and see either it's coming down or not or it's not maybe we have to investigate for other secondary costs yeah um, i think about the duration, it, huh? yeah it, 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 importantly is you need to talk to psychiatrists whether you can stop uh -huh. lithium if not yeah. you don't want to come they want don't want them to come in with recurrence of the bipolar <laughs> disorder first yeah. thing yeah <laughs> second thing is once they say they can stop then yeah. usually we repeat uh the calcium level in one month's time and, and you see that it's stable. Uh, after that, if it still remains to be stopped, then you can, um, uh, it's recommended to repeat at six months. Then it's still normal. Then, you know, this is uh, oh, oh, this lithium induced. Okay. So, um, okay. Um, this one is just to reiterate how they manage moderate to severe hypercalcemia come in with neuropsychiatric manifestation. Of course, the saline diuresis is first. Mm. Then, Need to start IV bisphosphonates concurrently. Um, if, if the patient already come with neuropsychiatric in, um, uh, manifestation, I think uh, it's severe enough uh, to subject patient on the second agent other than wait for the normal cell line to uh, bring action. Yeah, and remember, because usually all these medications that Dr. Haswani has presented, we require mm -hmm. minimum three days. Uh, you look at that. Uh, yeah. uh, whether it's denosumab, whether it's bisphosphonates, uh, even steroids is also about three days. Only dialysis would be very fast. Of course, uh, saline diuresis would be would be within uh, the period. If not, we won't be recommending it. And the other thing is be calcitonin. Uh, but calcitonin, remember, would be tachyphylaxis. So usually yeah. after three days, we would have stopped already. Mm. And by then, your your IV bisphosphonates your bis or even your DMAP the effect will yeah. start. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So I, I um we have a few more. Um, just it would be pretty quick. So meaning you're mm. seeing hypercalcemia written uh, in your presentation, say it's three to four milligram of IV zoledronic acid. Mm. So one question would be, would you consider five milligram if there's a fracture? Uh, because the one that uh, preparation that we are using uh, is not a cluster. The one that are available uh, zoledronic but to Zometa, the, the, the one preparation mm. that we're giving four milligram, uh, is it depends on the availability. Lah. If mm. you have five milligram, I think why not? Mm. Either is fine. Mm. And and after that, of course, when you want to, your pharmacist may ask you like, whether yeah. you want four milligram <laughs> or five milligram. By then, you just tell the indication if you're using for the osteoporotic fracture, then it's five milligram you're using for calcium, then yeah. it can be four milligram. And some patients are uh, they uh, in, in their clinic they say it is hyperparathyroidism already. And why still on alendronate? Um, uh, why apart from alendronate, that patient is still on calcium and vitamin D and for osteoporosis. Uh, would you consider stopping the vitamin D and calcium? Patient osteoporosis on bisphosphonate, why on calcium and hyperpara, hyperparathyroidism plus uh -huh. osteoporosis? So uh -huh. on alendronate, maybe opted for medical therapy. Okay. And, and, and the managing doctor saw, hey, got calcium and vitamin D there. Would you stop uh -huh. the calcium and vitamin D? I would, patient did not, did not underwent any, uh, did not undergo any surgery yet. Lah. Primary uh -huh. without surgery. Mm. Um, 
uh, I don't see why we should be continuing the calcium. You should stop the calcium. <laughs> and then I think the safest way to replace vitamin D deficiency is through inactivated vitamin D uh, because uh, you can control uh, um, the amount and then the risk of the uh, nephrocalcinosis is higher with activated vitamin D. Uh, if, they, if we have uh, vitamin D level, you should replace the vitamin D level as what uh, our target and then with the baby's phosphonate lah, because yeah. Yeah. the calcium would be high. I don't see the logic why the patient need the calcium. Hmm. Yeah, can you can you sort of like very briefly telling people saying that if you are sending a patient with primary hyperpara for surgery, mm. how soon will the parathyroid level resume to normal? Okay, so we we have uh, one uh, mechanism called intraoperative eh, parathyroid uh, measurement. So after we remove, after 10 minutes, 20 minutes, we can take the IPTH and it should be reduced. As soon as possible. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I think just two more questions. Um, uh, one is normal calcemic hyperparathyroidism. Uh, would you treat or how would you monitor? Okay. Uh, normal calcemic uh, hyperparathyroidism uh, is documented. So uh, if um, we should, we have to monitor. Lah. I think I showed the slides just now. Uh, it uh, it uh, apa tu? It applies to the mild hypercalcemia or normal calcemic hyperparathyroidism, meaning at least yearly serum calcium, uh, at least two yearly BMD monitoring, at least yearly uh, renal um, monitoring. I uh, as long as the calcium is normal and there is no other indication for surgery, for example, they might have normal calcium, but they might have some. Um, apa tu? Uh, renal stone, they might have some bone disease, some bone complication, they might be indicated for surgery, then we send for surgery. If not, no complication, we can just monitor as okay. stated before. Huh? Sure, thanks. Last question is about BMD report reading. They say mm. um, they know that T score less than minus 2.5 is to define osteoporosis. Yes. But then if only one vertebra is, is less than that, and uh. other mean score is more than two point negative two point five. So uh. consider or not osteoporosis. <laughs> osteoporosis, uh. Okay, first, uh, the others, uh, you must uh rule out causes why because if you have uh BMD, eh, uh as your vertebra comes down, it become more denser, more denser. Uh, by right, at least. Uh, if we have negative 2.5 afterwards, uh, it should be negative 2.1 and whatnot. Huh? Uh, first, you have a look at the BMD itself. Is there any artifact, for example, uh, upper to spinal fracture uh, that was never been documented before uh, that might lead to the falsely negative BMD? Huh? Uh, but if really the uppermost only negative 2.5, and the others is less than that, I will still consider osteoporosis. <laughs> okay. So, so, I mean, as, as doctors, uh, we tend to uh, take the worst case scenario. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, I believe, thank you very much, Hasmini. I mean, uh -huh, uh, also thank, thank you very much to, to the audience. Very interesting um, um, session with a lot of uh, Q&As. Yes. The last question would be, uh, the, um, I'm not sure whether they should ask you or they should ask the College of Physicians, but I uh, team, whether they can have your slides or not. Okay. Sure, okay. sure. Pass over. Uh, that one we discussed offline. <laughs> yeah, and then this, um, Dr. Lim and, uh, and and the COPM will be able to communicate with the audience. Over to you, uh, Dr. Okay. Lim. Thank you, Prof. Lim and Dr. Hazwani for the informative talk today. And the slides will be, the presentations will be available in YouTube later on. So with that, we end our sessions for today and hope to see you all next week. Okay. Thank you.